This is Jeremiah with I Love You, Jesus, as we get ready for Matthew 12. Now, we've already read this section, and you're going to have to read it again on your own. Uh, I'm not going to read it again. What I want to do is give you an overview of what this is and move on. We're not going to go through every detail. As many of you know, this is a deep subject. When you start comparing Old Testament laws with New Testament laws, it can get a little complicated. So to make things simple, I'm going to reduce our stimuli here, okay? We're just going to look at a few items. Are you ready to go? This is Jeremiah with the New Covenant. We're smoking here. We've got work to do, and we've got thinking to do. We've got concentration ahead of us. So let's do that right now as we think about loving Jesus first. Ready to go? This is New Covenant. I'm Jeremiah. I am your Bible teacher. We're looking at Matthew 12. You can open your Bible to that particular section. This will be part three, I think, here of, uh, no, this is part four. So we're really moving here. And uh, let's get going. Now, what I want to talk about first off is a review of what the last video had, which is the bottom line of the word Sabbath, okay? We need to hammer that home. Otherwise, we wouldn't get lost. You ready to go? What are we doing? We're listening to the voice of the Lord because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you wake up in the morning and you get yourself busy with church work of some sort. Or you pray and you get your Bible out and you start studying. And you start thinking about making your life, he that purifieth himself, he that hath this hope in himself, purifieth himself. So you're in the process of becoming a better man, a better woman, and you're in the process of doing that. Um, especially for you teenagers and you adults. Are you ready to go? We love Mr. Jesus. So your heart belongs to who? To Daddy. Now let's get going. As we get into Matthew 12, and we're going to get right into it, we're falling behind, so I'm going to cut back on what I want to do, which is spend a lot of time thinking about loving Jesus. Uh, I like to sit back when I get up in the morning and just think about loving Jesus and being with Jesus and just seeing myself sitting there next to a holy God and enjoying so loved. What manner of love? That's what we want to focus on. Are you ready to go? What, what kind of love is this? And we wake up in the morning, that's our first thought, and we begin to have praises and, and worship and adoration or uh, admiration and thanks unto our God. That's what we wake up to. You ready to go? Let's go. I'm pumped and ready to go. It's exciting that we're reaching people who don't have anything to do but stare at the wall and look at paint dry. And we're taking these people online here who are looking at uh, horror movies, violence, who used to be Democrats or homosexual or in a gang or you, you were with the devil. And now, all of a sudden, you're devoted your whole life to purity and growing in the grace of God. And this is what we teach here. transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because the words of the Lord are pure words as refined in a furnace on the earth seven times. You just entered the realm of intellectualism and you are now, uh, what's the word? You're, you're actualizing. You're dealing with facts now. All of the maybe Babylonian confusion terminology or confused terminology is good. It's saying bye-bye. Okay? Such as looking at what does rest mean? What does the word rest mean? Why is it different in the Old Testament and the New Testament? What's the difference? What's the same? Compare and contrast. Let's get going. As we, we do everything in one name here. My ear is open to the voice of the Lord. These red letters here in, in Matthew chapter 12. It's a lot, it's a lot of work here. Now, I'm doing this because I'm going to finish this shortly. I will not have a lot of videos uh, to put online. Now, I may have some live broadcast um, or some live teaching. But my last fellowship was with, essentially with Pastor Tom, and he passed away. He was transitioning from a semi-retired Bible teacher to fully retired incapacitated.
ever since Tom passed away, my buddy, um, uh, everything has slowed down to just going online now and perfecting this online ministry so that we might reach people because thousands of people hit this web. Uh, it just so happens that we're living in Sodom and Gomorrah, basically, so eight out of ten people could care less, and one out of ten are curious, and they might come aboard. So you're looking at one out of a hundred people who show interest online. We love Mr. Jesus. Your heart belongs to Jesus now, and that's all you see. You're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, and you see yourself sitting there, and you belong there. You see yourself there, you know you belong there, because you do love the Lord, so that's where you belong. You tasted and you saw that the Lord is very good. He's the good shepherd. He's the good leader, and we left the bad leader some time ago. The one who is leading you, who doesn't care about you. So let's go as we get into this. Remember, we're, we're going to go. We're going we're to cut off a lot of, of the music here. I want to like to. I like. I, I like to push this love Jesus music on you, and 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 and, and, and you know give you the good stuff here with taking out time to relax and enter that rest. That that's what that. Love music does. You're actually into this word Sabbatism or Sabbath. I think the Hebrew is Sabbath, but anyway, it means to rest. And so we're here to rest here. We're not here to get all stressed out. And one of the best things to do is get up in the morning and, and just sit back and relax and think about and have love Jesus music on. Just don't don't let up on it. Now, we have to let up on it right now because we have to get into some academics there, okay? And we're behind, and I apologize for that because um, this should be a little bit more relaxed presentation. But because the time is short and the end of the world, I'm going to squeeze in more information than I want to. In other words, you should have love and information, not just a lot of information. We should, be, we should stop and sit back and... And I'm telling you that you need to sit back and relax, take a deep breath, and just think about, wow, I am with Jesus forever. No funerals, no car accidents, no Democrats, no fake Republican or what they call rhinos, or no gang members. It's all over. That's what we think about here. That's called the blessed hope. That's the part of your Christian faith that you have many things that you're confident in, but the thing that you're confident in that makes you the happiest is getting out of here. Okay? So what's the number one principle in Matthew 12? The first lesson, the first lesson it basically is, out of many lessons here, is that the word rest and you entering into the rest of Jesus Christ is predicated upon you doing what? Looking at the word Sabbath and rest as the, the yoke of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament word for rest deals with one day a week where you can relax and be blessed on that day where you don't have to sweat and work. It's called a blessed day. It's also a day that's hallowed or it's a special day for God. Okay? That's what it means here in Exodus 20, when it says, remember the Sabbath, and to keep it holy, and there's no work for seven days. Now, what is that essentially? It is a presentation of where you can go once the 2,000 year period of Jesus Christ comes. During the 2,000 years period of Jesus Christ, you can enter into Jesus' rest, which is every day is a rest day. Not from physical labor, but from your position of being cursed. There's no more curse for you. Man had to work because he was cursed. 
and he was also going to die. In the Old Testament, you, you, you did not leave the curse of working six days, and you did not leave dying. You were going to die, even though you went through the procedures of the seventh day of rest. It was not meant to bring you eternal life. That's the point. But now, when you come to Jesus Christ, the term is now Sabbatism. It's not Sabbath anymore. It means a permanent rest now, but this rest is not from work, it's from your soul. Your soul is now at rest. It's not necessarily a reference to your body at this time, or what you can do in your body, or what you cannot do in your body. Uh, that is secondary at this point. Now the word refers to you being able to sit back and have rest in your soul as to you've been forgiven and you're going to heaven and you and you are going to have jesus christ in your soul living in you he's going to talk with you and walk with you and he's going to give you the comfort of his presence that's what it means now that's a big difference the word rest okay in other words in the old testament you did not get rest for your soul you merely sat back and rested for one day, physically. When you came to Jesus Christ, you put his masterhood on top of you, his lordship. You became adopted. You became a servant. You became an adopted child. We're going to get to that next. That's one of the big issues in this chapter. It's huge. We're getting into the heart of the teachings of Jesus Christ now. And th this is monstrous stuff. Kindergarten is over. This is high school graduation, postgraduate stuff you're getting in here. That, that's what's here. But I'm going to help you with this because the first co concept that you, that you want to hold into your head is that the word rest means not what it meant to the Hebrews. That was only a sign of what was coming ahead. It was not the real deal. It's like going to a restaurant and they have some plastic on the wall that looks like food. You're not supposed to eat the plastic that looks like food. You're supposed to eat what it represents. Seventh-day Adventist people, they're eating the plastic. They think the plastic food is what they're supposed to eat. No. You're supposed to eat the living water, the living bread now, so that you live forever. Those are the commandments of Jesus Christ. That puts you into a seven-day soul rest. And that's the main point here. You ready to go? Now, Exodus 20 tells you to remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, it's hallowed. So that means it's a very special day for the Hebrews. However, when we get to the New Testament, all of a sudden, you are no longer guilty of anything when you work on the seventh day now. That's the point. Okay? Every day now is a holy day. Every day is a special day for the Lord now. Every day you have His rest inside of you. You have His peace, His love, His joy. Uh, there's no more war. There's no more... Uh, you have that in you now which is essentially your future in heaven, you own your future. You own the peace that's in heaven now. You own it. Okay, you got that? Now, that's very important to go through this. The seventh day was not meant for a final lesson on the word rest. That's the point here. Okay? It was only an example for you to see where Jesus Christ was going to take you seven days a week. Okay? Now, one of the main things we're going to get into is, this is an option for the people in the Old Testament and New Testament. And now let's get into some deeper stuff. Are you ready to move now? You're ready to move on from that concept of the change and the transition of what the word means and what, what the idea of rest means. Okay? We're going to move on now. If you want to cling to the Old Testament and say, i got to keep the, the, the Sabbath day because it's an eternal uh, a statute, then we, 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 
that then you're wrong. And I can't explain any more right now because it's going to get confusing. There's more on that. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. People generally will get confused when you try to teach too much at one time. I know that. I used to teach. So my point is, is that we're going to stop right there on what, what's the difference between the line of demarcation between the Old Testament word rest and Sabbath to the New Testament. And it, obviously one is for your body and the second one is for your soul for you to be at peace. Okay, you got that? That's all there is to this. It's a seven day eternal rest for you in Christ, in your soul. That's where we start on this. Forget about the day right now when you get to the New Testament as a Christian person. You're not, you're not into days right now. You're into Sabbatism. You're entering into a permanent rest for your soul every day. And that's what the word means. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. You think about that for a while before we get into the next concept. Okay? So, having gotten that down, which is a very... This, it gets a little complicated here. Okay? Kindergarten's over. I had a Bible teacher call me not too long ago, and he said, you know, I think your ministry basically is a little too much work or something. Because he, oh, he wanted, What he wanted to do probably was talk about amazing grace every day. Some people want to do that. They, they, you know, they, every day you see them, they go, we're saved by grace. And, and that alone, and, and, and let's all have some dinner. You can't do that. That's very dangerous. I hope it works out for the people, right, who, who want to do that. I mean, we're not here to, to hope things don't work out for anybody. It's just that we, common sense tells you that Jesus said, you must live by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. What does every word mean? What does every word mean? That's the point. Every word means like every word. It, it, it's a, there's a lot of work here. The parable of the sower. I studied yesterday. I was commanded to study tomorrow. Okay. Now, let's get to... My second point, which is extremely significant. Of course, all of this is significant, but okay, let's go. The second point we want to make, because we, we have to slow down. As you know, I want to give you as much information as I can before this ministry shuts down, basically. And... I rush a little because I kind of have to. That's the point. But on this, we have to we have to stop because the name of this ministry is New Covenant. It means a new agreement between God and mankind, or you personally, and the word is impact in your dictionary. So the point is, is that this is a situation where we must go through certain things and really hammer them home before we shut down. And, and, and fortunately and unfortunately, as far as our time goes, uh, because this, this is obvious, obviously to me the end of the world, basically, that uh, we want to squeeze as much information as we can, but we have to be careful that we don't uh, not deliver the goods. Okay, you got that? Now, okay, now. What's your second point now that we've clearly defined what's the difference between Old Testament rest and New Testament rest? What's the difference? There's a huge difference. The Old Testament did not offer you rest for your soul. It offered you rest for the day. That was the blessing from God. The New Testament rest is you're born again, you've got God's love in your heart, instant snap, crackle, pop, you're saved. Jesus is in your heart. The Holy Spirit is filling you. There's a big difference between those two. That's the point. That's where you start with this. Now, there's a lot going on here, but I'm going to hammer home just a few points for you. Some of you have to go, you know, get your, your study on, on your own. 
This is a ministry online where we don't have time to, to go through everything for 20 years from now. We don't have that time. And we in America can see that by half of the half of the population saying that infanticide is something that they demand. They demand the ability to essentially <sighs> slaughter young humans. Okay, you, you figure that out. If you can't figure out it's the end of the world, you can't figure it out. Okay? That's the way it goes. Or 40 to 30% of the population says they think it's okay, and a lot of them think also it's okay to go into classrooms and talk to children about romance and stuff in, in detail. 30% say it's okay. That's what, I, that, that's what I saw on the computer. So if you think this is normal, we in America who are 69 years old like me, we know that this is freaky deaky, and you better be ready for Jesus because something's going to happen quick. Because when things get freaky, that's when Jesus shows up the most. Look out. See, that's the point. He's not blind to all of this. Let's go to point number two. Now that we've defined that, just rest on your laurels there. We're going to stop, okay? Number two is, you have an option. The people in the Old Testament and the people in the New Testament, they have an option. We, we have an option. Now, what is that option? The option is to, number one, is to enter into that rest, okay? You enter into that rest by allowing yourself to be open to conversion, number one, and to keep your covenant that you made when you were converted, right? In other words, you made a commitment to love Jesus Christ. Now you're going to say, okay, what do I do? How do I love the master? What are my, what are my orders here? How can I change the world to a better place? How can I, look, okay, what's my job? Now, that's your basic second point. Now, tied into that is another, another point as we move on. Are you ready? The next point is, is you have an option to study the law and to be merciful and caring. That's the next point here. You have an option to understand that purity and the law is good. And you need to teach the law. You need to teach don't commit adultery. You need to teach thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill to, to yourself and to your children and everyone in church. That's the next point. You're not here to throw the law away. We teach the law here. In it doth he meditate day and night. That's being blessed. Blessed is meditating day and night. Blessed is the man who walketh not with the wicked people. Psalm chapter 1. In his law doth he meditate day and night. You want to be blessed? Think on the law day and night. Now, what do we add to that law? Because this gets complicated. Now you add mercy to your study of the law. You're learning that purity is good. You're learning the law is good. You're learning that it's good to, to obey the laws of God because you're pleasing God when you do so. But at the same time, you're also learning that there are times when you are to be merciful and to forgive and not hold grudges. So now we go to the next part of this lesson. This gets a little complicated. I want you to pay attention. Now you as a human being or an Israelite or uh, someone in Western civilization, you have an opportunity to, to love, serve Jesus Christ and to enter into that service with two things in mind, that God is holy 
and he loves everything to be pure and holy and obeying the law. He loves it to till the cows come home. He loves people behaving well. He loves people not hurting other people. That's common sense. It should be common sense. He loves it when people use everything for the function that it was made for. So everything is in order. That goes for human order and it goes for nature order. The Democrats just blew up the pipeline and they destroyed the ecosystem in the North Sea next to uh, Norway. It's basically, basically destroyed. They, they can't even eat fish there now because the Democrats blew the pipeline up. That happens to be God's fish, God's ocean. They just destroyed it. Well, they promised to do it uh, last year. Because it's going to hurt Putin or something. Putin is not, Putin is an anti-homosexual uh, leader. That's, what, that's one reason why they hate him. America is basically a homosexual country right now. Full of perverted people. There's no question about it at this point. They were saying it was 5% of the population, 10%. No, I, I beg to differ. I say it's 30% now. Thirty percent, thirty percent of the population, they're homosexual and they're perverted and they like murder and that's the way America is right now. That's why we, who are sixty-nine years old, are waking up every day in shock because we didn't think it would happen here. We didn't think that human beings or uh, uh, men and women, especially women, recently are, are are so adamant about having the opportunity. It don't take away my opportunity to murder. That, that's what they're doing. It's, it's blowing our minds. There's so many people who will be so cold and so wicked, so filthy. And then, of course, now I'll tell you one thing. Before, let's stop the lesson for a moment. I, 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 I'm going to stop the lesson. Hold on. We'll, we'll get back to your option here. Now we who are older are beginning to see why God made hell. Before, when I was young, I didn't quite understand it. I didn't understand that people who were pushing, who would push for murder, would go to hell, and I didn't know what to think about it. Now that I've seen them on this web, looking mean and, 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 and drinking wine and champagne and laughing about supporting murder and so forth, now I'm beginning to see why Father made hell. Now, now I get the point. I get the point now. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, like, before it was like, doggone, I don't know. Now, after seeing them and looking at their faces, I just saw a lady's face here on the web. She said she demands to have the ability to murder. Not only just murder, but a, but a helpless human being who can't defend themselves. So now my, my pers perspective has changed. I'm beginning to see now, wait a minute, I guess that's where people belong. If they're that mean and that evil and that wicked, I guess they belong in a place far away from people who love. We, 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 we need to be separated from them. We need a jail for souls that are evil and wicked and devoted to harm and lies and whatever, uh, violence, we need to be separated from them. That's the word called sanctification, separation from evil. Let's get back to our third point here, which is the option to love the law and love truth and love honesty and embrace that which is good, and at the same time, have a door open for forgiveness and care for other humans who are also not going to do everything correct all the time. That's the point. They're not going to do everything correct all the time. Are you going to be open to still caring for them in spite of the fact 
that they do not deserve any help at all, just like you. The end of Matthew chapter 5, we just read that no human deserves any help at all. But you're going to love and care for them, even though you know that they don't deserve it and they, that they have broken God's laws. If you break God's laws, you don't deserve anything. But downstairs. But God is telling you that he wants you to care for people who deserve to go downstairs, and that's right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, Exodus. So we have a paradox, a dichotomy here. When you're teaching purity, you're teaching obey the law, you're teaching do not sin, you're teaching to be fearful of sinning, that's what we do here. The thou shalt not commit adultery is big around here. But peradventure you do it, we pray that you find forgiveness from the Lord. That's what this is. It's a living paradox. So the option to love the law, teach the law, that not, that not stealing is good. You're not hurting people. I had a car stolen. I, I started to break out in tears or something. Whatever. It, it was horrible. My, my car was gone. My beloved car, it's gone. They never found that car. It was a nice car. But I was hurt by them stealing. But they were, they were uh, aggrandized. They, they, they got $100 bills. So if I ran into them, I would probably, uh, according to the Lord's will, I would have mercy on them, and I would ask them, are, are you sorry that you stole my car? Is there any penitence for you? Are you sad? Are you sorry you sinned? And are you going to seek forgiveness through Jesus Christ? If so, I forgive you too. Forget about it. I'll show you mercy too. Because I've done things like stealing or, or, or robbing or lying or, or hurting people's feelings or whatever. I've done, I, I've broken the law myself. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and I was freely received mercy. I'll go ahead and give it myself. Now that's an option for the human being in Israelite time and in our time, to teach the law that it's good, it sure is, and, and that if you break the law, uh, God might wipe you out. That's what we teach here. However, we also teach that we hope, we just read, what was that, Psalm 20, uh, Psalm, uh, was that Psalm 20? I'm starting to forget my Psalms. Yeah, that, that, that we hope that God uh, forgives you of your whatever you did. I can lead you to forgiveness, but I can't, I can't hammer it home. Jesus is the one who validates forgiveness. Humans don't validate forgiveness. And you've been given authority. As a church teacher and a Bible teacher, especially a pastor, you have authority when somebody comes in there to tell them, okay, I, I, I feel in my spirit and the Holy Spirit that God wants to forgive you for what you've done, so go home. But as far as having the final say, the, the pastor doesn't even have that. The Lord's in charge of that. Jesus told Peter, I'm giving you a lot of authority to forgive sins in a church posture. However, he's not telling him that he's the ultimate uh, um, uh, judge in, in, that, in that situation. That's not the point. When he, when he tells him, he gives him the keys of the kingdom, and whose sins you forgive, they're going to be forgiven. That's nice, and it is, it is a legitimate office of a pastor and so forth, that Peter had that ability. However, it's not the ultimate situation. The ultimate situation is God, not Peter. That's an office and an ability, but it's not the final uh, judge's gavel. Let's put it that way. 
Common sense should tell you that belongs to the boss. Okay, that's the point here. Now let's go back to number three option. The, the, the option to, to love um, goodness, to love people being good. We love it when people make good decisions for themselves and, and for the people around them. That you didn't hurt Billy down the street. You sought to reconcile. You're a peacemaker. That's why the Bible says, Blessed are the peacemakers, because those are the ones who are going to heaven. These recent Democrats voted 100 to not, was it 199 to 1 votes or something that we send bombs over there that explode on children's legs. We, we, we all, the Democrats said, yes, go. Blow up the children's legs. Put them in the hospital. Give a nine-year-old a machine gun and have him get run over by a tank, and we want that to happen. Go, 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 man, go. I saw the president. I, I heard him say that. Now, is he making money on, the, on these guns, and that's why he's so happy? Oh, uh, I would probably say yes, but we're not into getting into personal people right now. What we're talking about is an attitude, and, and what's going to happen to you if you own this I-don't-want-peace attitude? So number three is we teach law and we teach forgiveness here. Grace. Okay? That's why Mary called God, holy is his name. She said, holy is his name. What a wonderful quotation from the mother of Jesus Christ at the beginning of your Gospels. She says, holy is his name. God loves the law. He is the law. He would never hurt anybody. Who didn't, who didn't ask for it. He's holy. But then she says, he's going to mercy us. So she's a very good woman. She's an upstanding woman. She doesn't participate in any sin. And so she's going to give birth to Jesus Christ. Um, and the father's going to be the daddy. And she's going to be the mother. And so what we have is God and man in one person. And she says that God's going to mercy her. So now she's saying that she's a very good woman and she doesn't do it, get, in, get into any sin, but she still sins because she said she needs mercy. So everything always comes back to, I want to be pure, I know it's good, but I really can't do it, and I need mercy every time. The book of Romans. In my mind, I want to do the right thing. But my body is pushing me towards doing the wrong thing. And the victor in all of this Christianity, the winner, the overcomer, is the one who learns to put your body in check and let that Holy Ghost reign in you in a pure life. That's a winner in this battle. Okay? But back to the main point. We teach the law here. But we also teach mercy. We teach the law, even though we know that you're not under the curse of the law. Romans chapter 3, we establish the law. That's right. I just had a lesson on the Ten Commandments. We teach the law here. We teach children, thou shalt not steal. Because there are ramifications for it. If you keep stealing and you become an adult, you're going downstairs. Okay, that's what we teach here. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So now, how do you remember the Sabbath in the New Testament? You remember the rest by coming to Jesus Christ and doing what? 
hungering and thirsting after the law and righteousness and living righteous and also seeking mercy, teaching mercy. You, you do both of them. It's just that simple. So the day is for people to do what? To be merciful and to teach the law. These people in this chapter, they're using the, the, the day to pound on people as a hammer. Uh, they are, what's the word that they use in America? They are judgmental. They, they, they can't wait to condemn other people. In their mind, all they think about is condemning people. Christianity is a balance where we tell you that you might be condemned, especially if you, you don't repent today and receive the forgiveness of sin from Jesus Christ by obeying the gospel. That's your first unpardonable sin by not repenting. Okay? So the day was supposed to be a day when you rest. It was supposed to be a day that you're blessed by God to rest and just relax instead of taking it as, a, as an opportunity to walk around town and look for people who are working and then condemn them. These are basically TV preachers. They, 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 they love to go after cash. When, when, when women die, they go to their homes and try to get the money. They're always pounding on people. You should have gave more. You should have gave more. You should have given more. If you give me more, uh, you're pleasing God. I can show you a scripture. And uh, they're just little uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. That's what they are. So we have an old law and a new law. And now we're looking at how the master who, who, who created the law, he's the one who wrote the law. He's the one who gave it to Moses. So, so Paul comes along and says, don't, any, don't, any, don't let anyone bother you about what you eat, what you drink, and there are, and, and so on. Don't let anybody bother you about a moon days, or it's a new moon, or Sabbath days, or any day. Don't let anybody bother you, period. Ooh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't have dinner all day. Uh, I, I didn't do this, and I did that, and, and you should have done this. Or you, you know, I, I, I fasted for 10 days. And then Jesus is going to tell them, I would rather have mercy than sacrifice. So people are saying that I didn't do this for 10 days, and I want, I want recognition. The, the Pharisees used to go without eating and walk out in the street and tell everybody, I haven't eaten for 10 days. Aren't you impressed that I'm denying myself? Voluntarily? Don't you think God is impressed with me uh, offering myself denial? God's impressed with me now. That's righteousness. Woo! But the Bible says your righteousness is filthy rags. So the, the Pharisees are filthy rags. Even though they haven't eaten for 10 days because they're bragging about it. If, if they were not to eat for 10 days and keep it to themselves, there might be some benefit in it. But if you're bragging about it, you just ruined it. So now every day is a day you can basically do what you want to do. There, there, there are no restrictions on you. Uh, Jesus said that you are, uh, you are not, you are guiltless if you do anything on any day you want to do now. And of course, the Seventh-day Adventists around the corner, they don't understand what we're talking about here. And it's not that difficult. This is high school grammar here. They believe you can't eat or drink this. Don't eat or drink that. Because a woman wrote a book called Mary Baker Eddy, and she said that you can't eat these kinds of foods, and you better not drink this. Paul said clearly here, you can eat and, and drink whatever you want to drink. That's third grade grammar. 
How can thousands of people not understand third grade grammar? Because they want to go back to the law like the Pharisees and try to find something in themselves that's worth something. Uh, you know, we, we, we observe that seventh day. We're smarter than you. We're like Moses and Aaron. We're sticking to the book. It says to keep it holy throughout eternity. They don't understand what, they, what that meant was you were supposed to enter into God's rest for eternity. Obviously the Master and Paul the Apostle are changing the whole program here. He said, don't anybody bother you about a Sabbath day. Well, my goodness, uh, that sure changes things, doesn't it? Don't let anybody bother you about a Sabbath day? Isn't that contradicting what we just read in Exodus? Uh, yes and no. It's contradicting it, but only if you understand that it's been changed. It, it was only meant for those people and the eternal ramifications are still there. The eternal ramifications of you taking out time for God are permanent. If you're going to turn to God on a Sabbath day and you're going to pay attention to God on, on, on every other day of your, of your week, you're saved. That's the point. So you're entering the rest of the Master in the New Testament, but you could not enter the rest of the Master in the Old Testament. And all you have to do in the New Testament is put on a servant mind, and he's going to give you his yoke, he's Master, and you ain't your servant now. Officially. He's the good shepherd, and you're one of his sheep. So now you own seven days of rest from your labors now. Now you're entering into the rest of the labors of Jesus Christ now. He paid for all of your sins. You are no longer cursed. Adam was told he was cursed. The ground is cursed because of you, Adam, because you don't listen to your commander. God is a commander. When he says something, you better pay attention. When my dad told me to do something, I better pay attention or that's my B-U-T-T. -T. It's the same thing that happened to Adam and Eve. God told them as a father, leave that tree alone. The day you touch it, you shall surely die. You'll go back to the dirt where I, I made you out of dirt. If you do what I tell you to do, you'll stay in this garden in peace and love with no devils and no accidents and no, no tornadoes, nothing. Just do what I tell you to do. I'm God and you ain't. Know your role. What's my role? My role is to listen to my creator, God. In the New Testament now, you're going to do what? You're going to hallow it be thy name now. My Father, which art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. God told them to hallow the seventh day. Now you hallow every day. That's the point. You don't just hallow uh, one day out for the Lord now. Now it's every day. Paul said every day is a holy day for him. Every day is a day where he says, hallowed it be the day now. Every day is hallowed. God told him to hollow the day. Hollow means to make it special for God. So now every day is special for God. Every day we teach the law. Every day we seek to be merciful. Over and over again, day after day. I wake up, I want the law. I wake up, I want to, I want to be forgiving. I wake up, I want the law of God, the teachings of God, uh, um, uh, that God loves righteousness. He loves it when people don't hurt people. He loves it. It's called righteousness. All the paths of righteousness are truth. All of them.
So we're, we're back to living bread again. If you are a 2,000-year person born, uh, a, a child of Adam, th then you have an opportunity to now eat living bread. And that living bread is to put the yoke of Jesus Christ on you and his commandments. And now you have rest for your soul now. And it's every day. It's not Sabbath anymore. It's Sabbatism. That's the word Paul uses. That's what remains for you now. Meaning the other stuff is gone. The example of rest is gone. The simile, the, the example of what God has planned for you, humans, for 2,000 years. An opportunity to enter into the, the perfect submission to Jesus Christ and then own rest for your soul. It's just that simple. Okay? Now we're about ready to move on because we really hammer this home. It's a little difficult. It gets difficult at times, but we, we have the main point of the idea of what is the difference between the word. What does the word mean in the Old Testament? What does it mean in the New? Right? Then we got into the option. What is the option here for the human? The option is that you can love righteousness and seek after purity, and at the same time, you can be forgiven and to be forgiven. You're not under the curse of the law anymore. It used to be you had to obey everything in order to know God. But not anymore in Jesus Christ. You can make mistakes in the law and still go to heaven. God is giving out mercy and grace to human beings. Which means he knows you made a mistake and he's still going to take you to heaven. That's the whole point. He's going to shine it on. He's going to cover it. He has enough purity and enough righteousness. He is absolute purity. He, he breathes purity. He can cover you with that. He's got enough. When he walks, purity follows him in a train like a woman's dress. And he can take some of that purity and throw it right on top of you when you love him. That's the point here. He can cover thousands and thousands of people in heaven in the rapture with white. So that nobody knows your sins at all. You're covered. In other words, the Bible was promising in the Old Testament Ten Commandments that God is going to bring a rest day for you just like that one day. That's the point here. We're just about done. There was one day of rest, but it was only as an example of what's going to happen in the 2,000 year period of Jesus Christ, which is now you're going to have rest every day, and that's going to be deep down in your soul, and the curse is gone. Because he had one day of rest, but the curse was still there for six days. <clears throat> the curse was still there for six days. But in the New Testament, essentially, it's all gone. There's no more work and sweat and, and, uh, and storms and, 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 and hospitals and funerals. They're all gone now. That's the rest you're going to enter into. That's a lot different than the Old Testament rest. They still had wars. They still had trumpets that warned them of uh, things to come. That's why Donald Trump is in charge of the United States of America uh, for, for a while here. Is because he, is, he means announcement. Announcement means something's going to happen. What's going to happen is, is Jesus Christ is going to take five Christians into the cloud and five Christians are going to get left here. And the warning is, you don't want to be five that are left here. That's the first warning. Got that? Because the evil people are basically evil and they're not going to change their mind. At this point, they're what's called reprobate, incorrigible. These Democrats north of here in, in Chicago, they're not going to change. They're Demo they are devoted to filth, murder, and scum. They're, they're totally devoted. They're drinking wine, they're brushing their teeth, and they're putting on suits and American flags as though they belong to this institution. But deep down inside, they know they could care less 
about the Constitution. They could care less about people's rights. They're just using this as a front. They're wolves in sheep's clothing, just like TV preachers. TV preachers are just like Democrats now. They pretend as though they care about the flag, people, Thomas Jefferson, or they could care less. They're enjoying filth. That's why they put the word freedom up here the other day at the Democrat Party. They put the word freedom up there. What does that word freedom mean? It means freedom to be filthy. That's what it means. And don't bother me. We, we who are in hell, we want to be filthy. Leave us alone. They don't mean freedom like the, 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 the MAGA people mean. The, no, no, no. The freedom they're talking about is leave me alone. The, uh, one of the Democrat heads came on TV the other day, the web here, and they said, what, what did he say? He said, all of you filthy people out there, I've got your back. That's what he said. I'm paraphrasing him. You people who are perverted, whatever, I'm, I'm in charge here, and I got your back. I'm filthy too. I'm perverted too. And I'm going to look out for you. Don't you worry about it. And you continue with your filth that we love. We love filth. We enjoy doing very filthy things to adults and even people who are younger than adults. If you can't figure that out, you're blind. In other words, hell is getting united right now. The hell is getting united now. They're not fragmented anymore. When I was 10 years old, hell was hiding. If they had the Grammy Awards, American Bandstand with music, there were no people with devil arms kneeling down and women uh, hardly dressed properly and, and eating fire or doing something uh, filthy or, or even worse, uh, uh, messing with the youth of America and, and threatening the youth of America with, with sexual assaults or something. All of this was non-existent. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. We know this is the end. So the Lamb of God is also a simile to the real Lamb. We're dealing with similes now, correct? We're dealing with items that are just there to give you an idea of what the future holds. Not The Lamb of God is not... Uh, the, the Lamb of God is the fulfillment of all sacrifices. In other words, the Jews get together and they, 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 they kill a calf and they say that their sins go into the calf. The Bible says your sins never went into the calf. It was just an example for you to see that your sins are going into Jesus Christ and he's going to pay for them. That's what, it was a ritual to teach you that. That's what the ritual is for. It did not remove your sins. Leviticus chapter 1 and 2 and so forth. Okay? I want to hammer that point right now. That a lot of things in the Old Testament are just there for you to see what's going to happen in the future, which is completed. You were never meant to have one day of rest. That's the point. You were never meant to have one day of rest. You were meant to have every day where you rest. Where the curse is gone. All the pains and, and the difficulties from you not listening to God, your Father... They're gone now. There's no partial uh, rest anymore. It's, it, you got the whole enchilada now. The curse is gone. Revelation 21. No more curses in heaven. I'm going to shut down here. A few more items. The five books of the law teach that there's one day that you rest. In the New Covenant, we teach that every day is a rest day. That's the point. Your, your soul was not saved in the Ten Commandments. But in, in, in the covenant with Jesus Christ, the New Covenant, the new agreement to serve and love Jesus Christ the Son of the Living God, if you make that agreement and you make that commitment and that piety and that devotion, now 
every day is a rest day for you. That's the point. And now your soul is definitely saved in stone. In the Old Testament, how do we know who's saved? You really don't know, do you? Not necessarily. You have a general idea of who's saved, but you don't know. In the New Testament, you can know, snap, crackle, pop, that you're saved. Without equivocation. That's why you're entering into a seven-day rest. Because your salvation is sure now, see? So this is reality indoctrination, which is submission to Jesus Christ is going to put you in a position of knowing the truth and reality. The true facts about the law. The true facts of what you're accountable for. What am I accountable for as a human being in this 2,000 year church period when I become a convert? What am I accountable for? What am I responsible for? You're responsible for, number one, loving Jesus Christ and going to him and confessing that you're a sinner and you need to be forgiven and you have, you have sinned against God. That's your first responsibility. You can do that at a, at a Protestant church or you can do that at home as an adult. It's not for children. It's not for toddlers or infants. That's demonic doctrine. A devil will tell a child to repent who's three years old, which is a Catholic. That's the point. It's an adult decision. And you're entering into reality indoctrination. You're entering into that which is beneficial for you. You're not listening to lies and confusion that are not beneficial for you out in the world. You're going to start eating living bread. You're going to start eating the commandments and teachings of Jesus Christ. And this is going to afford you eternal life, seven days of rest forever. That's the point. Okay? This is a 2,000 year option for mankind. It's called a new covenant. That's why I call this ministry new covenant. Because it's, we're living in a 2,000 year period where you can enter into Sabbatism, eternal rest. No, nobody's supposed to bother you about a moon or a Sabbath day or nothing. What you eat or drink. It's very interesting that this Mary Baker Eddy lady, who was, a, uh, I would say she was 33 degree Mason, and she made, she made a commitment to serve the devil in my opinion. But that's just an opinion. And she may not have been a man. It might have been, she may not have been a woman. It, it might have been a man. I don't know about the chances of that, but I, I think they're pretty strong. That that, that lady was masquerading as a woman. I, I, I think so. I think there are a lot of people you see on this computer who are masquerading as men or women, and they're not men or women. They're the opposite. That's kind of a personal kind of thing. We'll let go, okay? But they also tell you at the Seventh-day Adventist place that you can't eat this. And God, let's go into that for a moment. The Bible says that God is in control of all food and everything. You pray over your food, and it's set apart, and it's fine, because you prayed over it, and God, God has a job for you. If God has a job for you to go heal the person across the street and help sister so-and-so, and she really needs help, and he wants you to help her, a hot dog is not going to get in the way. I'll repeat that one more time. When God has work for you to do, Nothing's going to get in the way. You're supposed to be a worker, a love worker. And that's what God gives people opportunities to serve in an office. And if he wants you to serve in an office and he has plans for you, I don't think food is going to get in the way. That's the point. He made food. He supervises every molecule so why would he allow you to get sick and die when he has something for you to do? How can you help brother so-and-so down the street 
if you're laying in bed dying. You can't help them. That's common sense. You understand that? One more warning on the Sabbath. Why would you keep bothering people in the first place? Not only are you mentally retarded at this time, which doesn't mean you're not saved, and doesn't mean you may not get your act together. That's not the point here. The point is, while you're doing this, it's going to look ugly to the Master, because one of the seven sins uh, uh, that God hates are stirring up trouble amongst peaceful people. I'll say it again. You go bothering people who are at peace, and that's not good. I wouldn't do that. Obviously, you can get away with it. Paul makes it very clear that a lot of people are going to have problems with figuring this out. They're, they're going to have doubts about food. Oh, no, I can't eat that. And they're still Christians. That's not my point. Don't you understand the point here, okay? The Corinthians were told to watch out because they kept making lots of mistakes in their Christian walk. This, this can turn into something really bad. Disturbing Christian people with these things like, don't eat this and all of that. You should have went to church on Saturday when Paul clearly says, don't let anyone condemn you about any day at all. Any day. He said, one man says every day is holy of the week, and another man says every day. Let that man do what he wants to do. And here you come walking along and, and, and disregarding what we just read. And you think you're going to get away with it. Especially if you really want to go whole hog on this. Stirring up strife. You, you better watch yourself. Once again, we're not saying people can't be forgiven for, for going crazy over food. Oh no! Christian people must eat this kind of food. You know, watch out for food. We don't do that here. Now, if somebody comes along like Robert Kennedy, who wants to make sure that the food is healthy for the children and make sure it's better, we're not going to tell him to stop, are you? Common sense tells you that if somebody comes along and says, wait a minute, we just found out that's bad for you, we're going to take it out of your food. Take it out, bro. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good idea. But as far as freaking out about it, we'll never do that. We'll keep eating and praying. That's the point here, okay? If somebody's kind of freaky about food or something, and they come into church, we're not going to tell them they're not saved and, 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 uh, and hit them in the head with a hammer or nothing. That's not the point here. We're going to tell them to, why don't you just trust in the Lord? Because you need to trust in the Lord. Don't be weak in your faith. Trust in the Lord in everything that you do. Everything. It's very important for you, for you to put your confidence in Father's abilities. It's critical. And when you start loving Jesus Christ, Mr. Weak in Faith, and you really love Him, and you're, you're really focusing on loving Him, and really focusing on serving, you'll never go into these realms of, I, I better not eat this or nothing. You, you won't even think about that. You're too busy loving Jesus Christ, and that love has a lot of confidence. Love always has confidence. I'll say it again. Love always has confidence. Part of the problem with a, with a baby Christian is they haven't learned to really love Jesus Christ in an intimate way. The Greek word is O-I-D-A. It means to know the Lord well. If you know him well, you, you should be mature as time goes on in Christianity, in your walk, where you're really loving Jesus Christ and you know him well. If someone tells you to worry about food, you might laugh at them and tell them, dude, dude, hey, no, no, no. When you, when, you, when you know the Lord Jesus Christ well and you love him with all of your heart and you've, you've grown in the grace of Jesus Christ as a mature Christian, you're going to laugh at things like that. Because you know that the master is in control of everything and you know that he loves you. He's not going to let anything happen to you. That is not going to be part of the program. If I do get sick with the food, he's going to use that opportunity. 
If I get into a car accident, he's going to use the opportunity. Then when I go to rehab, physical therapy, I'm going to save someone in the physical therapy class. There's always a purpose for your situation. That's the point. And you always know that. You know that there's a purpose for everything that you're doing. So if you do get sick, you are going to go to a hospital and save a nurse. That if you do die, you get to be with Jesus Christ, and that's a win-win situation. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. You can't lose in any scenario here. That's what Christian maturity gives you. Win-win, always. Now, I'm done with this. As we, I'm not going to go through anymore. I have a few, few more points. Um, we want to go back to the word blessed and happiness. Uh, the, the Father says that he made the Sabbath day for you to be happy on that day. It's the same thing in the New Testament. When you, when you start loving Jesus Christ and get into this Christianity and start serving the Master and binding up the brokenhearted, setting at liberty those who are captive psychologically, you're going to enter into that rest. And you're going to be happy. Not one day, every day. Every day is devoted to Jesus Christ now. I don't work 10 hours in the field like a Hebrew anymore. I work, but I'm thinking about loving Jesus all day long. The Hebrews weren't doing that. Most of you Hebrews in the Old Testament for 4,000 years, they weren't thinking about the love of Jesus Christ in their heart every day. Maybe Enoch was, Elijah, but very few people were doing that. Daniel was doing it. Daniel was praying three times a day. That's the goal here, is for you to become one of these Old Testament patriarchs. We're not an everyday Israelite. No, you're Enoch. You're walking with the Lord all day long. That's the beauty of the new covenant for 2,000 years, is you're now Elijah now. You're not an everyday Hebrew citizen anymore. We don't know whether Hebrews are saved. They, they went to the temple, they, 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 they gave their, their, their Passover, they paid their taxes, they, they went into town, they went home, you know, they ate dinner, but we don't know whether they're saved or not. And a lot of them are probably not saved. But in the New Testament, you know in stone that Jesus is in your heart and you're saved. That's a whole, it's a whole new ball game now. It's a much better situation than it was in the Old Testament where we don't know John from Frank. Now we know that Enoch is saved. He got taken up. He never died. So he must have been walking with Jesus Christ every day, all day long. So now everybody's Daniel now. God's making everybody Daniel. It's beautiful. It's wonderful that you're now a grafted in Jew Daniel now. You're one of the Hebrews. You're going to the temple with Moses now and Aaron. You're reading the Ten Commandments and you're also teaching mercy, which is after the second commandment. God gives two commandments about how you love him and treat him and respect him. And then, then he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be merciful to thousands of people who respect me. Meaning, I'm going to forgive people who don't obey the Ten Commandments who respect me. Right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. Okay? Now I can go into human ability, I'm going to stop. Because that goes into abilities now. 
We're ready for abilities, human ability, and trying to please God in your flesh, in your abilities to do good. And, and filth, your righteousness is filthy rags. I'm going to shut down. That's making it too complicated for now. I'm done. This goes on, by the way. This can go on for weeks. We haven't talked about putting your hand on the lamb and your sins going into the body of the suffering person and all of that. The table of showbread, the holy of holies, the, the, the brazen altar. Uh, there's a lot here. The serpent uh, on the pole, uh, uh, look upon the serpent and be healed and all this Old Testament stuff that deals with rest and, and being forgiven. And this is a deep subject. I'm going to stop right there. And we're done with going over a few points. As a matter of fact, I'm going to review this myself because I want to make sure that I covered what I wanted to cover. But I think we've covered, uh, and I'll make a review on this. And we're ready, we're ready to finish the rest of the chapter, but we had to do this. Um, you know, as many of you know, we're, we're trying to really squeeze here. And uh, as a matter of fact, we're going to probably go over the rest of the book of Psalms in a very quick fashion because we've made a good foundation already. All That, that goes for the um, book of Romans. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick review on that. We just went through Romans. I'm going to go through one more time, and that's it. Okay? We're done with Revelation, another big book. So we're, we're doing a good job on going over these major books in the Bible, and then I'm going to shut down. Everything is going to be supplemental here. It's very exciting because... Once you get done with Matthew, you're basically done with Luke and Mark. And the only thing left is John. The book of Acts is kind of easy in many ways. Um, because we're not going to go over all of the episodes of these people. Of Paul, Barnabas, Stephen, whoever. We're not going to go through their episodes. We're going to touch on those. The journeys. Okay? Which means we're, we're very close to wrapping this up. I'm going to skim through the book of Isaiah, and I have those notes over there. I just looked at those. As we really get, get into a lot of discipline here. A lot of people are not going to, not going to want to follow along with this, but that's, that's between them and the Lord, okay? And as many of you have ascertained, I'm enjoying going through this because a lot of this I have not read for a long time. Especially the book of Isaiah, which refers to the 1,000-year reign of Jesus Christ, okay? Also, I've never gone through the details of the book of Psalms at one time. I've bounced around, but I've never really, let's go through this and really pay attention to every railroad track. Let's pay attention to every time the word mercy is used. And let's look at the context of that word. Let's look at the context of every time loving kindness is used. Excellent loving kindness, marvelous loving kindness. What's the difference? That's what we're doing here, okay? I'm done. We're not playing here. This is this is um, high school stuff here, and sometimes we go to co collegiate level here. Academically. But I'm making this easy enough for all of you out there uh, who, who have had problems with school and academics, that you have no excuse to follow along here. You're taking advantage of my benefits of, uh, of teaching in the past and teaching human beings, although they're very young quite often, uh, doesn't matter. They're still human beings. Humans basically learn the same way even if they're 5 or 12 or 18 years old. There's not much difference. Okay? Had a wonderful time going through this wonderful book of Psalms here, and we're rejoicing in all of this wonderful honey this to the mind, this sweet for the mind. The master just mentioned in this context that many people wanted to hear what we're hearing here, but they didn't hear it. They wanted to hear who the Messiah is and what is he going to teach about mankind and psychology. They wanted to know all of this, and we have it. Bam, there it is. Jeremiah, you're done for the day. Honey. That's it. We're going to wrap it up. And we're very happy to get through the a very difficult part of the 
idea of being blameless, even though uh, in the Old Testament you are not supposed to do something on this day, and, and clarifying all that. There's really no necessarily no need for that if you're going to skim through your Bible. What you want to get into is what I've already gave to you. I've given you the gist of what's going on. That the rest day was never meant for you to look at it as a day of rest. It was meant for you to see that coming to Jesus Christ, you have rest forever. That's what it was for. Got that? We're done. Now, some of you may, may be in the seventh day situation around here. Paul said he is a seven day Adventist. A Christian should be a seven-day Adventist. Paul said you can be a seventh-day Adventist if you want to, if you choose that day. But he says, don't, don't anybody bother you about you uh, having one day Thursday or have every day. He said basically that he has every day as a rest day and a holy day, every day. And that is what you're supposed to look that that is the the proper perspective of the rest day because the word sabbatism means forever so it can't be a one day thing it's in infinity without interruption therefore observing it as one day is not technically correct you can still do it but technically, you've entered into an everyday rest for eternity. And a wise man who wants to become mature in Jesus Christ, probably like Paul, you're going to make every day a Bible study day. You're going to make every day a day that you're open to serve and enter into his rest and speak of hollowing every day. Every day is a holy day. The Lord said, make the seventh day hallowed and special. Basically what that means, right? Unto God. Well, shouldn't the mature Christian think along the lines of Paul, which every day is set apart as a hollow day? A special day, a holy day? You don't have to be stuck in the Old Testament uh, um, weakness or inferior position of one day. That's inferior. In general, if I have one day for the Lord, isn't that inferior to have every day for the Lord? I, I think that's uh, uh, um, in stone, isn't it? It's unassailable that you're going to have every day a holy day as opposed to one day. It doesn't mean not saved. We're not knocking you for doing that. We're just saying that a chicken can figure out that having seven days put apart for the Lord and, and, and hollowed and special for the Lord, it, it, duh. So, so let's be getting on the ball. Let's make every day. That's my exhortation. That's not my command. Jeremiah, are you shutting down? Yes, sure. Sir Jesus. Isn't there a star called Sir? Sirius? Yes, there is. S-I-R-I-U-S. That's probably probably where we get the word Sir from. I think sir means ruler, but we'll let that go for now. I'm a, I don't want to guess on vocabulary. Jeremiah is on fire, and I, I don't have any more time for the Sabbath right now. I might give some addendums down the road, because we're going to see this scripture again in Mark and Luke, okay? Let's go. We have to finish this chapter, and uh, once we do, it's time to really start doing, and uh, I won't give you any more administrative ponderings. Jeremiah. Are you on fire? Maranatha means the Lord is coming. Paul the Apostle, Corinthians 16. Maranatha. If anyone love not the Lord, 
Cut them off. There comes a time in your life where you need to be very observant to people who do not want to love the Lord. Paul said, cut them off. People don't love Jesus Christ. Cut them off. But do that with wisdom and the Holy Spirit. Correct? Maranatha, shalom. Amen and hallelujah.